Thanks. Title's not my work, I'm afraid. That's somebody else. Okay, I've got a new title. So, hello, I'm uh, Dan. I'm actually a software tester, but uh, about five or so years ago, in previous jobs, I was a uh, software developer. And I, when I moved into testing, I thought, you know, it would be uh, worrying that I find it boring, because I started to find developing a little bit boring, and I thought testing is going to be just as boring. I thought, actually, it's just going to be tick boxes, you know, just does that work, check, does that work, check. And then I quickly worked out it's not just testing, it's doing other things too. It's about doing some of these things which we're going to talk about today. And it's just not just about checking boxes and making sure things work. But before we start, I want to talk about how you're all probably developers. You're also testers. Don't just say, yeah, but I'm not a tester. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with everyone in this room because a good tester, a, a good developer even, also tests things. They're not just writing code all day. So don't just think, this doesn't apply to me. Because all these roles I'm going to talk about today absolutely does apply to you. Because in my opinion, one thing that makes a good developer a great developer is being able to do all this stuff as well. Something which Lorna spoke about this morning, in fact. So, the first role we want to talk about is how we're psychologists. This is generally the stuff that we do when we're sitting alongside UX. It's about thinking about how the user will use the product. It's about wanting to learn and know how the user behaves, how they'll react to something, how they'll use something, and how they intended to use something. Not only does it help us find any potential issues, and it helps us create a product which will be better for the end user to use. I've got an example of a US problem that gets me all the time. You know when you have a little button uh, uh, that when you click it, it takes time to load? Maybe, you know, the internet's a little bit slow, or you're using a slower old computer or mobile phone. Here's a uh, good example, you know, you've got that radar app, and obviously everyone clicks no. But let's say it's a bit slow to load, so you click it again, Then you end up doing something you really didn't want to do. It's about knowing what your user's likely to do. So if a button doesn't work straight away, or you've got no feedback, after a while they're going to click, press it again. Being a psychologist, it's knowing this. It's about, you know, when you're testing the, uh, or developing the app, it's about trying to click the button twice, see what happens. It's just for example, if I wondered why on the iPhone autocorrect never gives you the word it wants, it's just got those embarrassing mistakes. The, the creator of the keyboard on iOS knows that a user will type things inaccurately on the iPhone. So they go for the safest option. They don't want you to write a report about ducks and then accidentally swearing to your boss. As a psychologist, we need to think about how a user is likely to act. And so if we know how a user is likely to act, we can find out how we can test this to make sure it doesn't cause a problem. It's about making sure there's no embarrassing or destructive consequences of what a user will do, even if you didn't intend them to do that. We also need to think about whether your app causes any distress. It's always worth being uh, aware of what kind of things that can cause issues for your user. If there's any kind of trigger in your app, it's good to know about it and being able to deal with it before it becomes a problem. A really common example I come across is sound related. By suddenly playing a sound when it's not expected, at best, you'll cause embarrassment, let's say, 
you're on a train or you're in an office. At worst, you can ruin someone's day by doing that. Unexpected sound can cause a real problem for anyone, but especially those with sensitivities, logistical support system. Some people do react badly to unexpected loud sounds. How many times have you jumped when you heard a loud bang? How about when you see those videos where it's really calming, really quiet, soothing music and pictures, and then suddenly it's that picture and that loud scream that makes you jump? How did it make you feel? If you're creating a product that does this, ask yourself why you're doing it and will it affect people negatively? On to our next role, lawyer. There's plenty of rules that affect our industry. We all should be aware of them, even at high level. I am, as you can tell by my accent, British, UK based. So I can only talk about the UK stuff. But if you do work in products in different countries, or international or multinational uh, uh, products, it will be different for you. And of course, I'm not actually a lawyer. It's just a person I can't play when I'm testing. You should speak to real lawyers if you need to about this stuff. Don't just listen to what I say. First of all, this data protection. In the EU, this is GDPR law. In the last few years, data security has been a massive thing. There's big fines and reputational problems if you're getting this stuff wrong. There is lots of training on GDPR now, and if you've not looked at all this stuff, it's really worth learning about it. It's not hard to learn the high level stuff either. It's accessibility. In the UK, we have the Equality Act. There's plenty of similar laws around Europe and around the world, in fact, on this. Generally, you can't go wrong with W3Cs, WCAG, guidelines. There are a lot of them, but it's well worth learning at least some of these. And this is standards and laws for your own industry. You might be in the gambling industry, you might be in the media industry, you might be in the medical industry. These will all have rules and regulations that's worth learning about because your company will need to follow them. And it's always worth you as a developer, as a tester, whatever your role is, being able to bring up these potential problems before it becomes further down the line and it's already been built. So now you can, uh, these are also useful so that you can test against these local requirements. It could be that something has to be done within a certain amount of time. If you know these legal requirements, you can test them as you're developing them as well. So, moving on to uh, being a spy. I work with uh, medical machines. Take, you know, when you go to the optician, take a uh, photograph of the back of your retina. I work testing the software behind those machines. It's not my job to know how the machines work. But I make it my job to know how these machines work. And I also make it my job to know how the eyes work. I can't know everything. Biology is hard. And machines are incredibly complicated. But I do my best. I listen when people talk, when people plan these things, when people tell me about these things. And when I can, I ask lots of questions. Because the more I know about the stuff which isn't directly my job, the more I can test, the more I understand what the machine is doing, so the better my test results will be. I'll be able to spot a problem with the output instead of relying on somebody else to tell me whether or not output is okay or not. I'm not then relying on someone else to do my job. <coughs> and secondly, try and be sneaky and look at the competition. It's always worth knowing what the competition's doing. Because it's always helpful to know what people are starting to expect from an app or from a feature in your app category. It's always helpful to know if there's better ways of doing things than what you're doing. I'll give you an example. Um, how many podcast listeners are in the room? 
Uh, and if you heard of Overcast, really awesome, really awesome uh, podcast player. The guy who wrote it, when he first wrote it, he, invent, he introduced a really couple of really cool features. One of them being boosting the sound pools for speech, so that you can listen to it a lot clearer and a lot better. It's like the output of an iPhone is the music, really, I think. And the other one is about tuning silence, because there's a lot of silence between when people talk, so you can listen to the podcast a lot quicker. Brilliant ideas. People are starting to expect these features in other podcast listen, listener apps. So it's about standing on the shoulders of the giants. So Mark Cole, the author of Overcast, took what was already in podcasts, built on top of that, and how people are building on top of that. Because people looked at the competition and thought, what can I take from that competition? If we were able to feed back that information to our product owners, it could help make what we build a lot better. As well as Spice, though, we're also researchers. <coughs> Being able to research helps you back up your claims. When people talk, always listen. Always read things. Always want to know more than what you already know. If you have these facts and research ready, you can back up any claims that you make. If you've got an opinion, I say the developer, that you want to talk to your product owner about, if you have figures, then you're more likely to be able to convince that product owner of your opinion. You might be wondering how you can do this. What I find a great way is to uh, get involved in user testing if you can. It's fantastic primary research. It helps you get to know how people are actually using your product instead of just guessing how they use it. I remember what I said earlier on that we're psychologists. Be the person who asks why something is done in a certain way. Be that person who goes to find out if you don't know. Find out if you're new to the team. Was the framework chosen for any particular reason? Was there some feature in that framework which isn't in other feature in other frameworks? Was the decision actually made? Was it kindly chosen by accident? If you know these things, you can use this information to guide both your future development decisions and to guide your testing. Because if you know that framework has kind of been chosen by accident, because it's maybe the lead developer's favourite framework, it will help guide your testing because you'll know what the pitfalls are, what the issues are with that particular framework. And just like any other researcher, go and read research papers. I'll give you a story. I once found a bug that was caused by a specific way of using a touchscreen. We needed to know really to make a decision how big of a problem this is. And we didn't really, you know, it was only me and the US person. With a sample size of two, we just didn't know. We know how we used touchscreen, but we didn't know how other people used touchscreen. What I thought is that touchscreens are massive now. I bet there was a lot of time, look, uh, a lot of research done on this particular problem. So I spent a little bit of time just looking for research papers. I used Google Scholar, great place to start when searching for this stuff. And it helped me back up what we thought, if I thought not, it will be a bug we need to worry about, or a bug that probably will be a massive issue for people. And also, if you can, it doesn't need to be research papers on Google Scholar. It can just be about reading blog posts, because they can be great too. You know, you get a lot of people just doing work day to day who will blog their findings. Always oh, worth reading. Linguist. You might think that you're a bad writer. You might think you're a bad speller. That's okay. I'm an awful speller. 
But when it comes to language, there's probably something that you can help with. This is where this comes in. This is the obvious spelling, grammar, punctuation. Which, by the way, if you're not very good at it, I encourage you to at least learn some rules. Because school, when I was a kid, it made this stuff really boring. You know, it's just like, oh, you need to learn these stuff by rote. But I find, as a tester at least, it's kind of a list of things that you need to check. It's like a list of rules. And I find this stuff really interesting now. So I do understand it's not for everyone. But if you can learn a couple of things, even if you're not that interested, it can prove really helpful for when you're developing or uh, when you're reviewing other people's code. It's not just the documentation, user interface, by the way, that you should be checking this stuff in. It's always easy to read code that has good spelling and good punctuation, good grammar. And the typo, I'm sure you all know, can be the cause of a, what, a small typo, big bug. So if you're good at this kind of stuff, you can probably find some pretty bad bugs earlier. And I find just having variables that are spelled correctly is just nice. So I don't know how many projects that you've been in where there's been a typo and a variable, or a spelling mistake and a variable, and you just kind of had to live with it. Style guys. Some companies have style guys for the writing. Find out if yours does. So when you get back to work on Monday, find out, does your company have a style guide? If it does, great. You see any writing that uh, you might write or other people might write in the, uh, in the front end, in the US, make sure it matches the guidelines. If your company doesn't have any, if you want to see some good ones, I recommend very highly the BBC News uh, style guides, guidelines. It's free. You don't need to be a BBC member of staff to see it. Just Google BBC News writing style guide, something like that. And it's a good way, even if you don't want to follow it strictly, it's a good way to see what good writing for news, admittedly, looks like. On a similar thing, a really easy thing to check are brand names. Because brand names are very often misspelled, especially when it comes to capitalisation. You might not care as a consumer, but the marketing people care a lot about getting stuff right. So if you can get it right, then you'll make marketing people very, very happy. And that's really important to get these people happy. Here's some examples of brands you probably haven't heard of all of them, but you've probably heard of most of them, at least half of them. They're very often written or spoken different to how the brand guideline actually says it should be written or spelled. It's like Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. I never go to a shop and say, can I have Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, please? But if you go to the website, that's what it's called. So if you work for Coca-Cola, that's what it should say on the website. So ask yourself, do you work with brands? Do you know how they should be written? If you do know, do you report any inconsistencies? If you see any? Because I think it's really worth doing so. It will make the writing people very happy, like I said. If your product's international, and it has localization. If you can speak that localized version, that localized language, it's always a good thing to throw feedback and issues that you might find. Because sometimes when it gets translated, the translations don't quite make sense. I think most people have seen these examples. It might be embarrassing, but often it might just not feel right, you know what I mean? So it's a small thing, but this kind of thing does make a good product feel a lot better for the end user. So if you do have the knowledge, there's no harm in pointing out these issues to others. And even if you only speak English, 
or if you have this and localise, it's still worth, if you notice this stuff, feeding it back. Because there might be some copy that will might just not feel right. You know, it might be a sentence on a button that doesn't quite make sense, might be unclear. Maybe instructions are hard to follow. If it doesn't feel right, if you ask a question, even if you can't actually put your finger on what, what the problem is, then often the person you say it to might say, you know what, you're right, I was thinking that too. And by speaking up, you're able to make your good product even better. And finally, we're historians and we're sociologists. It's always worth knowing what could be offensive to different people or what could make it impossible for someone to correctly fill in. The more we know about society and the history of, so the history of society and how people behave and react in such societies, the more potential issues we can find. This guy's a really uh, great example of this thing. For those who don't know, it's the um, magician's pen and teller. This is Teller. That's his name. That's his full name, it's just Teller. So if you have first and last names on your web form and you expect it to fill both of them in, I expect Teller was sure to fill in that form. There are many other examples of such things. We assume that people, anyone can complete a form. It's not just name either. It could be something like the gender, or the location, or the postcode. Here's a uh, link to uh, a really good uh, website called um, False Programmers Believe About Names. It's got some great ideas about what we think makes a name but could actually be wrong because we think about what's, what we're like. And remember, it's not just about names as well. You know, there's some really interesting uh, uh, things that people believe about gender. That people think that there's only two genders. Or that if you're, uh, if you're a woman, you only buy pink things. So it's always worth you know, reaching out, looking at this stuff, reading about this stuff then you can help make your product better and maybe not think. Another thing to check is, is it offensive? <coughs> it, can be easily, it, it can be easier to accidentally hate, uh, have something that you think is fine but turns out to be offensive or just unsuitable for other people. When you do that, you can cause a problem for people. It might not be, you know, offensive anger. It might just make them feel offered. For example, it's one thing okay in one culture, but not okay in another culture. You might not uh, think about uh, such a thing, but you know, in Europe, there's a bigger day privacy culture in Europe, you know, with GDPR, and how people react to data than in other places, like America. I know there's a great generalisation there, but generally that's the case. So if you're creating a product that has bad privacy policies, or bad privacy practices, in America they might be fine about it, but you know it might be for, you know, find a bit unsettling. Think about, you know, Facebook. Think, oh yeah, it's fine, we'll just take everyone's data, we'll just give it to everyone else, and that'll be fine, won't it? And then you were kind of, please don't. Language can be a potential issue. It's a brand name considered rude in another language. Thankfully, you don't see it that much nowadays, but sometimes there'll be a name for a product and that is fine in one language, but might mean something like just completely rude in another language. Or is the language you're using just not sitting right with other, other people, other languages. I'll give you an example. You might swear in front of you know, your mates in the pub, but would you swear in front of your parents? Would you swear at work? 
still totally okay language to use, but just different contexts. Let's do gender and age. As I said before, I turn people away. She says something that I just can't relate to, or even worse, find offensive. Someone might be, uh, might be elderly, and they just can't use that app we've made. Could just be they don't. It just doesn't. They don't think the apps for them. Where well, actually it might be, you know, they could use that. They might just think that. It's something where if it upsets people. There's no gain whatsoever. Why are you doing it that way? Going back to the pink pens. It will upset a few, uh, few people for having pink pens. You might think it's funny. But you're upsetting people, so what's the point? And finally, on this list, religion and race. Are you being accidentally anti-Semitic? Are you accidentally saying something racist? These things are the most delicate things to get right, so I'm not the person to talk about this kind of stuff. But these are things you do need to think about, because these things do cause people a lot of problems. The more we can learn about different religions and different races, different cultures, the more potential pitfalls we can find and avoid. As people who make software for all kinds of people, it's up to us to find out as much information as we can about these different people to make sure that we don't make these mistakes. As developers, as a tester, we can help with that. If we can point out potential issues before it becomes a problem, it's so much better both for the product, for you, and for the company's reputation. The more information we can give, to the product owners, to the decision makers, the more useful we can be. Finally, when it comes to history of social media, can your product be used in a way that's unintended? I've got quite a meaty use case for this. <coughs> it's a product that's been used in an unintended way quite a lot, especially in the last few years. And it means it's become in my opinion, a worse product with a bad reputation. I'm talking about Twitter. There's something really interesting about Twitter. It's got a real rich history of people using it in a way that wasn't intended in the last 10 or so years. It's been around. And it has a history of dealing with it really well and really badly at the same time. Let's start by the unintended uses. Uh, that make it easier. <laughs> to Twitter's credit, they've done it a lot. They found unintended uses and made it better. In many ways, just like a list here, and there's probably a ton more as well. These are the ones I could just think of. You'll probably forget that you didn't have app replies when Twitter first started. So on many occasions, Twitter has seen that the users, or even at third party apps, have done something in Twitter. And that's made it easier or a better experience themselves. And they've made it part of the system. They've seen that people have been doing retweets by manually copying and pasting and typing the RT and then in tweet. And they've made it easier for people by having a retweet button. So, even to the point where initially there was some pushback. Thinking about the app replies, massive pushback on that. People thought it wasn't a good idea. But years down the line, it's just a normal part of Twitter that we actually appreciate. But you don't have to look far to find examples of bad actors on Twitter. It's been blamed for some high profile accounts being hacked. The services have been accused of being the vehicle for election rigging. It's being used for international diplomacy and not always in a good way. It's also been a medium used by a CEO who's been charged with fraud. 
through Twitter. Twitter have done a lot of really cool things. I still really like Twitter. And I have got it right a lot of times. But here's the rub. Recently they've got a lot of things wrong. Badly wrong. A lot. In having a conversation with someone once, we are talking about a potential new feature that Twitter were apparently introducing. And they said, yeah, but it's Twitter. I don't trust them to get it right. You don't really want that kind of reputation for your company. It's not just Twitter. If you're making a tool, we as developers and as a tester can always be thinking, how can it be abused? <coughs> can bad actors use our tool to cause problems? Can people potentially break the law with it? Do we want to allow that? Are we happy about that? It's not a question we can answer ourselves. But it doesn't stop us from asking it to others, if we can. Because my job as a tester is to tell the product owner and others about the risk of a new feature, of a new uh, idea, or something that's been written. And it's a risk. So it's my job to pass on that risk. So think about how the product will be used. And if you can, keep an eye on how, uh, how it's being used. Keep an eye on the user's behaviour. You probably want to make sure it can't be used for bad. But if you do find the user doing something cool with it, great. Bring up the idea of making it part of your product, just like Twitter did. So there we have it. We might all be testers. We might all be developers. But it's much more than just sitting at a desk writing code, if you want it to be. I am a tester and I love testing because it's a wide variety of things that gives me scope to do and I believe anyone can do all this stuff. If I had my job, I would just spend and just checking things against the list of that certain criteria. I find it so boring. As a developer, I found it so boring just sat there writing, you know, developing a list of that settings criteria. But I might be a tester. You might be developers or product owners or UX designers. But I think we're all with these things as well. And we might also be other things too. I encourage you all to be now. It's gone. I did put, please join in, rate my talk. I did have a link, it's gone. But thank you, everyone. Please, yeah, join in, rate my talk. Hey, thank you, Dan. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, oh, yep, yeah, we have one there. Have I managed to turn this on? repeat the question just uh, the question was is there a mix between developers and testers in my team short answer no long answer is we encourage our developers to get involved in testing so i don't just say this is all my job don't you test go away i'll do all the testing we do encourage actively our developers to look at automated testing automated code, look at the results of the automated code, do code reviews, uh, run, run stuff, check stuff, yeah, anything I do, I also encourage the developers to do as well. So, yeah. Any more? I have to do work now. <laughs> okay.
Okay. So I'm assuming you are kind of a coach to your developers on how to test. And I have another question, which is, is there any good ratio for the number of uh, developers and testers or QAs? I'll answer the second question first. I don't, I don't know at all. I think it kind of depends. And here's the question, do I see myself as a coach? I try to be. Obviously, if I'm spending all day going up to developers and saying, mm, you should be testing that yourself, you know, I won't get very much done and I'll probably won't last there for very long. But yeah, I do try to encourage and help developers. And yeah, like I said earlier on, I try not to be all, oh, this is mine, go away. You know, I try to be open and friendly. I think it helps that I used to be a developer, so I can kind of talk to developers. I'm just saying, it sounds awful saying I'm saying awful, but I'm not just like on the other side of the office throwing results to the developer. I sit next to developers and we work together. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. So I have to go up on this side. So at what point in the process do you work most? At what point do you think it's most effective to work? Because I see uh, testers usually towards the end of the process, mm. like a gatekeeper before it goes out. But mm. at that point, obviously, the work's been done, a lot of things have been decided for you to then say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. It might not go down very well, so at what point is it effective and when is it accepted within your team and your setup? Uh, I really know that I just get involved as soon as I can. I, I would, if I need to, invite myself to meetings, talk to you about our future. I'll kind of say, yeah, I know that's where we found a backlog, but can we talk about that for a minute? So, yeah, for me, as soon as I can. The minute <coughs> I hear about a, product, a uh, feature and a product, I'll start thinking in the back of my head about all this stuff. I think, yeah, if I feel I've... I feel I've failed if I'm given some call to test and I've never seen it before. I think, yeah, the earlier we can make it, the better. But I do understand it, that can be hard to do. So for me, I personally think I failed, and that's not to say your testers and your companies are rubbish because you, <laughs> it is, yeah, as soon as I can. Company culture as well. Yeah, yeah, it's like a stupid question. Uh, yeah, it's like it could be part of the culture. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really hard to change. I agree. But if you can get the culture there, that, that's fantastic, in my opinion. Uh, you, you said earlier uh, that you encourage uh, developers to do automated testing. Does that include acceptance testing? And if so, do you get involved in the specifications of that? I mean, can you talk about your workflow? Uh, yes. So we've got a few teams in my company. We do it slightly different between teams. So we kind of... Yeah, we kind of try to get as many people as we can involved in the acceptance criteria. We try not to write too much. We try to write as little as we can to... Because I think if we're going to start saying things like there is a hero image on the, on the website and the hero image should be in this size and the hero image should be in this and the hero image should have this old text. It, it's like, you know, we're intelligent people. Yes, we try to make it so that we are all involved as soon as possible and so that, yeah, developers can also take that acceptance criteria and put it into the automation. So we use um, BDD, you know, given when then for that. So we can, they can take that, copy it, put it into automation and change it if they need to as well. We don't strictly say, 
this is the acceptance criteria, so this is what should be in the future part. But they can then take that and build the other bits behind the automation as well. I also help them with that as well, and they help me very often doing it as well. So, is that great? Any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you.